stopped uh, on Tuesday talking about how um, the, the the idea of, of of the atom sort of started to come in, in into being, and scientists, chemists, physicists, alchemists, whoever they were, started to notice things like um, that uh, molecules were always um, showing definite proportions, like you had one atom and one atom, or one atom and two atoms. It was never some odd number, and that the mass. Of, of reactants going into a chemical reaction was equal to the mass of the, of the products afterwards. And so these things were conserved. And so this is an example of one of those um, indications that there's something going on um, for something small that interacts with, with something else or what we know now as, as the atom. And of course we have you know, another genius Frenchman You'll notice that most of the great uh, chemists have French last names. Uh, Joseph Proust. And he noticed when he was um, looking at, he was doing experiments with a lot of different uh, molecules. And noticed that no matter if he had a, like a, a pure substance, it didn't matter what um, um, part of a substance he looked at. It always gave the same proportion of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, whatever it is um, he was looking at. So in this instance, he had like three different um, um, samples of octane, or what we you know, usually think of it as, as gasoline, although it isn't all octane. There's a lot of other um, hydrocarbons in there as well. But he had a pure, pure octane. And notice that when he looked at the amount of carbon and hydrogen in there, it was always the same ratio. There was always like five and one third grams of carbon to every one gram of hydrogen. And it didn't matter um, how much he took or how much he looked or how little he looked at, that that ratio was always the same. And that applied to that particular compound. But then we started to look at other compounds. You notice that sometimes it was slightly different. Like um, if you burn that same octane and look at the molecules uh, that, that carbon produces, they notice there was two different um, um, carbon oxide compounds. One had, let me just be able to draw on this thing here. One had 57% oxygen and 43% carbon, and saw that over and over and over again. But there was also another species that was also being produced. This was a second carbon oxide that had just carbon and oxygen on it. But this one had 73% oxygen and 27% carbon. Now this is by mass, because um, they didn't know what the mass of the atoms were at that time. They could measure the mass, they could measure the mass of each one, but they didn't realize um, how many moles of, of each one was there. They just noticed that there was, this much of the mass was carbon, this much of the mass um, was oxygen. And it was always fixed. It wasn't like, you know, it was 57.1 and 42.9 for that particular molecule. It wasn't 56 sometimes and then 44, it wasn't 50, 50, 50. It was always the same. So these two molecules always showed up with the same ratio. Now we know now that because that ratio based on mass, now that we know what the mass of a mole is, we can now figure out how many molecules there were of each one. So if you take 100 grams of each, of each of those compounds and you look at the masses of oxygen and carbon, you notice that the, the ratio of those two masses is 1.33 for, for the first one. Now for the second one, if you look at the ratio of carbon to oxygen, 
you see it's 2.66, which, hmm, that's exactly twice as much. Not close to twice as much, it's exactly twice as much. So this tells us that there is exactly, oops, let me go back. There is exactly twice as much um, oxygen in the second molecule as there is in the first because the ratio of oxygen to carbon, oh, damn it. The ratio of carbon to oxygen is 1.33 and then it doubles, which tells us there's exactly twice as much oxygen and the same amount of, of, of carbon. So there's a, precisely a two to one ratio. And it was that ratio that started to get people thinking there must be um, a whole number of each one of the, of each whatever um, oxygen and carbon, however, however they um, are, whatever small pieces they are, they must join with each other in precise ratios. And that started the whole idea of, that started the whole idea of, of, you know, the mole concept came, came from this. Now, John Dalton came along in around the turn of the 19th century. And he had all this information that people had been, been getting at, looking at the, the ratios of, of, of atoms in, in molecules. And he came up with basically these five postulates or five, five hypotheses that he had about atoms. So, one, matter whatever it is, is composed of exceedingly tiny little things called atoms. Now that wasn't a new concept. I sort of um, told you that like even back uh, in, in, during the, the, the height of, of, of the Greek empire in Athens, Democritus said the same thing like 5,000 years ago. But now there was a little bit more information because Dalton said that the atom was the smallest amount of an element that can participate in a chemical reaction. And we know that that is, is true. He also went a little bit further and said that an element has only one type of atom. That's basically the difference between an element and a compound. A compound has two or three or four, however many types of atoms it has, but an element has only one. And the mass it's characteristic of that element, and it's the same for all the atoms of that element. Now, he wasn't quite right about that because he didn't know about isotopes yet. But um, he was pretty right, he was pretty on, on board saying that, yeah, they're pretty much all the, all, all the same um, mass. Not quite, but pretty close to the same mass anyway. Now, atoms of one type of element differ in properties from all the other atoms of different elements. So basically saying each atom is unique. And we know that from, the, from, from the, just looking at the periodic table that yes, all atoms are unique. They have some similar chemical properties that we'll get into. That's why it's called a periodic table because these um, chemical characteristics are periodic, but they're, but they're unique in, themselves. So oxygen is different from carbon, which is different from manganese, which is different from iron, which is different from uranium. Now, when you looked at a compound, now a compound consists of atoms of two or more, we know that some, some compounds are huge, two or more elements in a whole number ratio. And that was, that was the, the key to the whole thing. Basically, we can't, since we can't have two and a half atoms of something, we, go, we have to have a whole number because these small little atoms, this is a, whoops, let me go back. This is as small as they get. They don't get any smaller than this. So we can't have half of one or a third of one or a quarter of one. We have to have one or two or three. That has to be an integer number. Now, if we look at this particular compound, this is copper oxide copper two oxide, so that would be CuO. 
it's black and powdery. So it's absolutely, it looks really nothing like copper or like oxygen. It's a unique combination of the two of them. And if we take any portion of this compound, we'll see that they're always in a one-to-one -one ratio. Just like when we looked at carbon monoxide, that was a one-to-one -one ratio, and carbon dioxide was one to two. This is copper two oxide. Why do we call it copper two oxide, not just copper oxide? Because copper has copper one oxide. What does that mean? It means uh, copper, copper is a transition metal and it has uh, different charges. Right, so sometimes, sometimes copper can be plus one, and we call that copper one, and sometimes copper can be plus two, and we call that copper two. And we'll, we'll explain, when we get into the electronics of different atoms, we'll see why, why that is. That's, that's kind of a fun part. I like looking at the transition metals. One is... Oh, go one ahead. Is, uh, one is red, one is black. Copper one and copper two. Yeah. Yeah, it's the uh, copper one is red and copper two is black. So the I last mean, the part of Dalton's atomic theory, and this comes this comes into why uh, the mass of, of reactions are conserved. Atoms cannot be created or destroyed during a chemical change just like energy cannot be created or destroyed. They just change, they, they rearrange and form a different type of matter. So the exact same number of atoms, so if we have a reaction, it's like you know, hydrogen plus oxygen goes to water. We have exactly the same number of hydrogen and oxygen atoms making the water as we do in the water at the end. So we can't destroy them, we can't create them. They just go from one form being bonded to hydrogen or oxygen. It's uh, alone and then converting them to water, which oxygen is then bound to, to hydrogen. But the atoms themselves have not changed. They're just basically switched uh, uh, binding partners. And that's true here for the copper oxide as well. The, like copper, we pretty much know what copper um, looks like it's got a, it's the surface of a penny. It's not the interior of the penny that's zinc, but the outside of a penny is, is copper. And so it's got that sort of shiny kind of brown, uh, uh, color to it. And oxygen of course is a, is a clear, um, completely transparent gas. But when you combine the two of them, now those atoms have now switched partners. Oxygen is not bound to oxygen anymore and copper is now bound to, to oxygen. Now we have a black compound, which is now powdery. It's not a gas and it's not a, 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 a solid. It's a solid, but now it's a powdery solid. Those atoms didn't go anywhere. They're the same atoms they always were. They just changed who it is they were sharing electrons with. And remember, chemistry is all electrons. Oh, let me go back. So that was 200 years ago that Dalton came up with these ideas. And we see that he was right about, about everything except the isotopes because um, at that point, um, there wasn't really anything um, that could separate different isotopes from each other. So when they measured the mass of a mole of, let's say, um, carbon, they would get like 12... 0.011 grams per mole. Because if you take a mole of carbon, that's how much it weighs. What wasn't known at that point was there was no way to separate carbon 12 from carbon 13 and carbon 14. That would come later. And remember, this was before um, the proton was discovered, the neutron was discovered, and the electron was discovered. And we didn't know what, so if they didn't know what those things were, they certainly didn't know what the masses of them uh, were. So what have we learned since then? So we didn't know what atoms were made of. 
didn't know if there was something smaller than an atom. It was thought at that point that atom, that's as small as it gets. You can't get anything smaller because um, at that point it was se it seemed to be indivisible. You can't that, break uh, an atom down into anything smaller. Yeah. That uh, the, uh, the Dalton says and uh, the sad. Uh, the well, never mind. What was the question? Uh, did uh, did Dalton Dalton said that or, or or something? Oh, Dalton said that yeah, the smallest possible thing was the atom. Okay. And that and, and that was the accepted wisdom because it couldn't measure anything smaller than that. So it was thought that you could break molecules down into atoms, but then you couldn't break atoms down into anything smaller. So the atom must be the smallest thing um, in existence. And if you can't see anything smaller, well, that, that, that makes sense. Why would you think there's something smaller if you can't detect it? But then he, these are some of the developments that showed there actually were smaller things than that. And this came much later. This, so this, we're talking like, you know, 70, 80 years later. That was the, Dalton's thinking was the thinking of, of everybody. And then there was something called a cathode, cathode ray tube was developed. And what a cathode ray tube um, was, was basically you pumped out a tube, pumped out um, all, all of, the, of, of the gas, and you would have basically two charges in there. So let's look and see how this shows up. So we'd have a charge here. Whoops, let me go back. You had a charge here, like a plate here with a negative charge and a ring here with a positive charge. And basically at, at the cathode, you'd have some kind, of, some kind of metal. And basically you would put electricity through uh, the metal. And then something would be released. What that something was, didn't really know. Um, and so it would go from the cathode through the anode and then hit a barrier at the back. And at the barrier at the, at the back, this, this would be something fluorescent. And we're not really going to talk too much about fluorescence. Anyone know what, what, like, what fluorescence is? Uh, something emits light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, uh, something fluorescent is a material that when it's excited, when it goes up in energy, it emits light. It emits light for quite a long time. So, I mean, pretty much any atom, if you excite it, will emit light, but for a really brief period of time. And as soon as the energy is turned off, it stops. Fluorescent materials when you excite their, their electrons in, into, and we'll talk about excited states and ground states. When, but with the fluorescent material, you excite it into the into a, a excited state, and then it takes a long time for the, for the uh, electrons to return to the ground state. So it emits light for much, much longer. And so the other thing that was noticed about this, so they noticed that metal, excite the metal, it fires something, something comes out of it, hits the back of this tube and then light is emitted. The other thing that was noticed that here you can see is a magnet. And that if you tune the magnet, if you change the, the uh, charge on the magnet, now we know like electromagnets, if you, you can move the charge from one side to the other by changing the electric current. So they noticed that if you, ch if you move the magnet around, that beam moved too. And that until just recently, this is how televisions work. The first televisions were cathode ray tubes and you're probably too young to remember, but- um, Oh, I do remember. Yeah, the old, the old uh, um, computer monitors were huge. They were really, really Heavy. big, right? Those were cathode ray tubes. So basically you'd be sitting in front of the, this cathode ray tube with this beams, you know, hitting, um, hitting the, the tube. And so you can control where those, um, exactly where the, the, if you were like writing something, the magnet would just basically move and you could see all the different uh, letters. And then um, you would paint the, uh, the, uh, 
fluorescence, three different colors. You'd have one that was red, one that was blue, and one that was yellow. And that's how color TV came along. So by moving it from the red to the yellow to the blue, you could make all, all the three primary colors. You could make all the other colors um, as well. And so JJ- Red, green, blue? Red, no, red, yellow, and blue. The three primary colors. Yellow, blue. Mm -hmm. So um, Thompson came along and studied this a lot more. It was, it was invented a, a few years before. Um, in Germany, um, and it really didn't have a use, a uh, scientific use for, 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 for a while. But uh, Thompson was fascinated by this because he wanted to figure out what these particles were. So if you could figure out there was some kind of particle coming from the metal and hitting the back. And what he was able to, to, to determine was that these particles were negatively charged. He determined that they were negatively charged because as you moved the, um, the magnet, that the, the beam would move toward wherever, wherever the positive pole was. So if you move the positive pole to the right, the beam would move to the right. So these particles were attracted to the positive charge. So they must be negative. They were, they were moving toward the positive charge. The other thing that he noticed that it didn't matter what the metal was. You could put any metal in there. You could put aluminum, you could put iron, you could put um, uh, gold, silver. It didn't matter what it was. You got exactly the same particles. They acted precisely the same and it didn't matter what the, what the source material was. Now we realize what those particles were, were electrons, negatively charged subatomic particles. So less, than the size um, of an atom. And the mass is more than a thousand times less than an atom. So they're much, much, much smaller than an atom. And the mass of the atom was determined in this next e experiment by Robert A. Millikan. So Millikan um, wanted to see how big these particles were. And so what he would do was have this particular apparatus. It was called an oil drop experiment. So he had a, whoop, let me go back. He had what was called an, an atomizer, damn it. What we would call basically an aerosol. And so it would spray out these incredibly fine uh, droplets of oil. And so, so we'd have these really fine particles of oil up here and then basically subject them to an electric charge. And so we had um, a brass plate here on the bottom, which was negative, And the plate up here was positive. And we put electricity um, through it to charge these oil particles. And then look through the eyepiece and see when the, the um, particles were actually balanced in, in midair. So he, by, by changing the, the uh, charges between the top and the bottom, he'd see exactly at what point these molecules, these really small drops of oil would be suspended in midair. And then you'd be able to measure the charge it took to balance these, these, these small drops. And so we noticed that, so coulombs is the, is the unit of charge. So a coulomb is basically a unit of electrons. It's like how many electrons you have in, in, in one place. So a coulomb would be like a, basically a mole of electrons. And so he took meticulous notes and did meticulous calculations and noticed with these five different oil drops, these were the charges they had, 4.8 times 10 to the 19, 3.2 times 10 to the 19, 6.4 times 10 to the 19, 1.6, 4.8. And he noticed there was always a ratio. Like when he looked at all of these different um, oil drops with all these different charges on them, he noticed they all had something in common. They are multiples of 1.6 to the 
10 to the negative 19. Yeah, they were all basically multiples of one number. And so that number must be the charge on a single electron. And he worked it out. So the charge in the oil drop was always the same. It was a multiple of this number. So it must be, well, if, if everything's a multiple of that number, that must represent the charge of one. Because sometimes I see one, two, three, four, ten, a hundred, you know, whatever it was. So that must be the smallest charge possible. So we concluded that that's the charge of one electron. Now, Thompson, before, when he was doing his experiments with the cathode ray tube, showed that the mass to charge ratio was this that you, if you could imagine how, how many um, electrons there are in a kilogram of electrons, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of charge. So he showed that that was the mass to charge ratio of, of the electron. And he determined that by measuring how much energy it took to move, to move that um, uh, dot around, to move, to move the beam. It took a certain amount of energy to do that. And by, by going, working backwards, showed that that's what the mass to charge ratio was. So now that you had the mass to charge ratio and you had the charge, you can now calculate the mass. So here's the charge. Here's the mass to charge. We get rid of the charge units and we're left with kilograms. And so you can see that's an insanely small number. That was smaller than any of the, um, any of the um, measurements for the smallest particles, the atom. That was small, and, and, and so that blew everyone's mind. Like, just like, wait a minute. We've discovered a particle, like a thing we can actually detect that has a mass that's like thousands of times less than what we thought was the smallest thing in the universe. And so that began, you know, a whole bunch, this that's basically began the golden age of, of thinking about the atom and, and subatomic particles. This was the beginning of all of that, was actually detecting and measuring um, something that was much, much smaller than an atom. This was, this was huge. So any, any questions so far, like how, how they did these two experiments? Uh, did you say a uh, Coulomb is a... Uh more of electrons it, yeah basically it's just it's just it's a it's a unit of charge yeah uh, but uh uh 1.6 times 10 to the negative uh, 19 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd doesn't give me one yeah it's 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 not exactly that it's it's basically it's 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 a it's a definite amount of of electrons i can't i think it's it might be like a gram of electron or something i can't remember precisely but it's 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 the unit of 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 charge okay so everyone sort of rushed to sort of figure out what the hell was going on here um now we've discovered something smaller than an atom what uh, how does it fit in with our thoughts about it and so immediately since it's this is a negative particle and it was known that atoms are neutral in charge. Well, if there's something negatively charged, there's gotta be something positively charged too. Mm -hmm. And Thompson, who originally um, did the experiments with the, with the cathode ray tube and basically discovered um, that these particles were negative, said, well, if there's negative charges inside the atom, there's gotta be positive charges inside the atom and they must match each other. And so, and this, he came up with what's called a plum pudding uh, model because they love their plum puddings over, over in England. And so basically he thought, and this, you know, when we think about it now, this makes the most sense um, because we know the positive charges and negative charges are attracted to each other. So why the hell wouldn't they be together? That makes perfect sense that, um, where you have positive charge, you'd have a negative charge next to it and they'd cancel each other out. That makes, that makes sense. And this is someone who really doesn't get the credit that they should. He's a sort of like a forgotten uh, person at this time. He's a Japanese 
a physicist named Hantero Nakaoka. Now, he had the idea that no, the way that the atom probably is, is situated is like this, sort of like Saturn, where in the middle, you've got this, these positive charges and a ring of, of negative charges on the outside. And he suggested that because he noticed from the, from the cathode ray experiment that these electrons came off when you put energy into it. So it makes sense that they wouldn't be bound up uh, tightly with the positive charges, that they must exist somewhere away from them. And so it's easy for them to be ejected from the atom. It turns out he was right. But nobody thought that this was a particular, people thought this was insane at the time because, and for good reason, what the hell keeps this part together? These are all positive tr charges. They would repel each other. How can you have all of these positive charges in one place without it just flying apart? And at the time, and even now when you think about it, um, yeah, why would you have that? That doesn't really make any sense. We know now that this is one of the four basic forces in the universe. This is what's called the strong nuclear force. And that is what keeps all of these protons stuck to each other. Because without it, they would all fly off away from each other. And it's one of the four fundamental forces. Anyone know what the other three are? Uh, excuse me, could you repeat the question again? What are the four fundamental forces of the universe? It's only four so far. Fundamental forces. One should uh, be fairly gravitation? obvious. Gravity is one. Yep, that's gravity is definitely one. Um, mag mag magnetism. Yep, electromagnetism. Electromagnetism. Yep, mm. that's the second one. The strong you know, the nuclear force is the too. third one, and the, you're not going to know the sec the fourth one. The fourth one is the weak nuclear force. And that determines radioactivity. So I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't expect you to know that one. But it's really unbelievable when you think there's only four. That's it. Um, and which explains pretty much every, every, everything else. Um, but we didn't, at that time, didn't know about the strong and the weak uh, nuclear force. That didn't come into uh, physicists thinking until much, much later. But um, as always in science, someone comes up with a ridiculous idea that everybody rejects until they get enough. So th this is just an idea. This is just a hypothesis. And then data emerges that explains this hypothesis, and then it becomes a theory. But for Nakaoka, it wasn't until about 20 or 30 years later that uh, he was shown to be right. And that's why people don't really think about him as much as they, as they should. So after the uh, discovery of the electron and Nakaoka's idea that there must be a pocket of positive charge with a ring of negative charges floating around it. Later on, this is like 20 years later, the nucleus was discovered and he was shown to be correct. So you probably remember this from high school, hopefully, or um, maybe from whatever last chemistry class you took. One of the most famous experiments in, in science. So one of the things about gold, gold is a really unique uh, substance in a lot of ways. It doesn't really um, oxidize. So if you find like a gold coin that's like, you know, 6,000 years old, it's still shiny because it takes, it doesn't really uh, react with oxygen like a lot of other metals. Um, the other thing that's unique about gold is that you can flatten it till it's incredibly thin. Everyone's probably seen like gold, gold leaf. You know, I think you can even buy it in like at Michael's. Yes, or something, in the smoke like shop in actually. In craft stores. It's really super, super thin, right? It's like basically you just blow on it and, and, and it moves around. You could just like take a piece of gold leaf and drop it and it'll just like basically almost float in midair. It's, it's so light that the air will keep it from falling. So what Rutherford did 
was take a piece of, of, of gold leaf and you can hammer it so thin that it's only like a couple of hundred atoms thick. That's how thin you, you can get this stuff. So we had a very, very thin piece of, of gold foil. And gold, Here, gold was linked to the money? Yes, because it was shiny. That's why gold and silver have always been uh, linked with money because they don't tarnish. Silver tarnishes uh -huh. a lot quicker than gold. Um, Isn't it because of the availability of, uh, availability of gold and silver as a resource? Isn't that why it's tied to money? That's true too, but, but also, um, I mean, you know, uranium's a lot less uh, <laughs> <laughs> available and you don't use that for, for, for money. I think it was basically, you know, A, you know, both those things. It's rare and it's shiny. People like shiny things. Um, if agree. you give someone like a lump of, of something that's like, you know, um, black and, and not very shiny, it's like, mm, this doesn't look particularly valuable. It just sort Actually, of, you know. I had a question about gold because yeah. in the past year, there's a lot of things coming out as edible gold where they can eat gold and they cover chocolate with it and they, people have been eating it too. So is that yeah. normal for metals to be like this? No, it isn't. Um, like you, you probably shouldn't. There's a, I mean, there's certain metals that you need. You actually, you actually need. Um, like, like you have to have iron. You have to have uh, magnesium. Um, you have to have uh, manganese. You have to have copper. You have to have cobalt. Like in, in small, really small amounts. Small amount. Uh, gold, you don't, you don't really actually need, need. And the thing yep. is with gold it doesn't react, it's non-reactive. So it doesn't, like all those other metals I mentioned, you need them in their ionic form. Like cobalt, you need it in a plus two form. Iron, you need it in a plus two and a plus three. Uh, it wouldn't uh, be toxic, but it would uh, harm your, your, your stomach. If you have yeah. too much, but gold doesn't react. Gold will yeah, just go uh, right Like right uh, physically, and, and like uh, some, Little uh, particles will pierce your your your, your uh, what uh, organs. Your well, gold isn't isn't radioactive. I mean, uh, it, uh, it physically would like you uh, uh, when you eat something small, all small things um, like uh, for mount. Uh, it will stick to your intestine. What like, will? You kiss me? What will stick to your intestines? Like the, um, because the uh, gold would uh, not like uh, you eat a uh, whole uh, uh, big gold. Uh, it, it, if you eat it, it will be like articles uh, like uh, piercing your, your intestine, I guess. No. So. No, no, it, it doesn't, it, um, it doesn't react. And so basically it, it will go right, right. I mean, uh, you'll, I mean, you'll have some very shiny poop, but you know, that's, it, it's, 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 it's not toxic. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, never mind. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so what gold was used for in this particular, um, example, this particular experiment was Rutherford wanted to see um, how big the atom was. Um, so what he did and to find out how, like, how big a, what the atom was, basically, was he took a source, oh, uh, the, a radioactive the was, source. Yes. The thing I was talking about was gold was. Uh, relatively heavy, it would uh, uh, make your intestine uh, work very uh, intestine work very hard. Like uh, like like uh, you have small particles. Like uh, uh, yeah, mm, I don't know how to explain uh, explain it. No, most like heavy metal, uh, like poisoning type incidents is basically. I'm not saying it's, it's poisonous. Uh, not I'm saying the, not in the, the intestine. 
If you like, eat anything that's sharp, it's going to harm yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's just yeah. common. Yeah, that's, it's not, that's it's, not what he's talking about. Yeah, it's not sharp, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, seen and in history people uh, swallowing gold uh, uh, and dead for the, for the, in the history. And people who swallowed the gold and died. Yeah, I mean, if you eat too much of anything, it's like generally not good for you. But like, uh, like this foil, like on chocolate or something, there's so little of it. It's not. It's not. A, it's not an issue. Yeah, if you eat like a pound of gold, that's not going to be good for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, back to the 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 experiment. So what we've got is basically a target here of gold foil. So this is like, just to reiterate it, it's just a few hundred atoms thick, very, 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 very thin. And so basically what Rutherford wanted to do was to probe um, the atom to see um, what's in there basically. And so to do that, he had a radioactive source. Now radiation, um, uh, Mary Curie had basically discovered um, both uh, um, sources of, of radiation and determined what kind of particles were released from radiation. So she'd won two Nobel Prizes. So she's kind of the bomb, one in chemistry, one in physics. So and had named this particular element radium and determined what particles were released from it. Now, alpha particles are basically two neutrons and two protons. So it is a helium atom without the helium nucleus uh, without the electrons. So what was all that was known at that point um, was that it was positively charged. It's small and it's positively charged. Neutrons and protons hadn't been, uh, hadn't been worked out yet, but they know it's a beam and it's coming from the, the nucleus, that, that part was known, and it was positively charged. So here we have these positively charged alpha particles, beam of them, shooting at the gold target. So now if the, um, basically the, this, this whole um, the foil, was basically all filled up, that the space, space was like completely filled with atoms, which was the thought that this beam would hit it and then bounce off. And it would bounce off at some angle, like around here. It would, it would bounce, bounce back. Now, that wasn't what was found. The amazing thing was that the vast majority of these particles went right through. And that was surprising, like right through it, like, like it wasn't even there. Some were deflected slightly. So some like went through and then were, def were deflected slightly to one, one side or the other. And then the other thing, a very small number of particles were significantly deflected. They did not go through, but they bounced back at an extremely sharp angle, like up here like almost right back at, uh, at the source of the particles, like came back very, very sharp angles. So this was not what was expected. What was expected is sort of like, you know, if you throw, a, throw uh, something at, at a brick wall, it'll bounce, you know, basically um, off it at, at some angle. Um, but you have most of these particles going, going right through. So that sort of scrambled everybody's brain because basically what that said was that most of the atom was empty space and that these particles could just pass right through it. And that didn't make any sense to people at the time. And so Rutherford just, oh, you know, sat down. Yes. So people find uh, alpha particles before electrons, right? Oh, around the same time. Around the same thing. Yeah. 
Well, okay. I was just thinking uh, if people found alpha before the electrons, they was uh, found alpha was uh, positively charged, and they uh, they uh, will they uh, assume something that has to be negative charge. Yeah, could be, but yeah, you don't you don't. But unlike electrons, you don't get to, alpha uh, particles from every every element. It's only very few. Um, and not even every electro, not even every radioactive element emits alpha particles. Only a certain number of them do. So it's electrons are universal. Alpha particles are not. So you could you could wave away um, the the negative charges because it's not universal. Okay. So what what was basically what what came out of this particular um, experiment? So the thought was, there must be something, let me just go back for a minute. What must be going on, or what he th thought, Rutherford thought was going on, is that A, empty space, most of the atom is empty. There's nothing there. B, there's something really, really small in the middle um, that's actually doing the deflecting. So there's not much deflecting going on, but what there is, is there must be something really, really small in the middle of the atom. And whatever that is, must be positive. Because we're shooting positive um, um, uh, beams, positive particles at it. And the ones that are deflected are getting deflected in a, in a way that's much more than if there was just a, a neutral charge. Like there must be something pushing them away as well as just deflecting them to one, one side or the other. So two things, most of it's empty space, and B, there's something in the middle that's positive and really, really small. And that sort of led to the idea of like what the atom must look like. And so this became the idea of what the atom must look like when they started putting all these different things together. So in the middle, We've got protons and neutrons. Now, neutrons weren't discovered for another 10, 15 uh, years before neutrons uh, were discovered. And that, again, came from, from radiation, where neutrons, a uh, beam of neutrons were released. And so they could detect a mass, a beam, but it didn't have any charge. And so, that's the, okay, this is something that's coming from the nucleus. Um, it doesn't have a charge on it. So it's not a proton, it's not an electron. And so they called it the neutron for neutral. Makes sense. So when they measured the masses of all these things, you can see here that the electron is about 4,000 times smaller than either the proton or the neutron. And it is found outside the nucleus. So inside the nucleus, we have a positively charged particle. We have a neutral charged particle. And then around the outside, we have a negatively charged particle. Now, this idea um, has been you know, with us forever. What wasn't known at the time, but then was sort of figured out, is that there's electrons in the nucleus too. And that was shown also by radioactivity by beta particles. Beta particles are negatively charged particles that also come from the nucleus and they're, electro they're the size of an electron. And where they come from is that, what do you think makes up a neutron? If you have protons and electrons, what do you think makes up a neutron? A neutron? Yeah, why is the neutron a neutral? Why it's a neutron. Yeah. It's not zero. zero. What if you added a between the two charges? Yeah, if you add a proton and an electron together, you get a neutron. And so later on it was determined that yeah, neutron is actually both those things. Uh, held held together. So 
So a neutron is basically a proton and electron together. Because the mass of a neutron is slightly bigger than a proton. Not by much, by about that much. So it's the two of them uh, stuck together. So basically you have protons and electrons in uh, the nucleus, but the electrons in the nucleus are basically joined together with protons to make neutrons. That's where they come from. So this is our modern model. So you have the nucleus in the middle. It's super, super small. Now the size of this, to put things in perspective, um, would be like if you took, you know, the football stadium, wherever the 49ers play, and you put a grapefruit at the 50 yard line, that would be the size of the atom would be the whole stadium. And the size of the nucleus would be the grapefruit at the, at the 50 yard line. So you can see it's really, really small. And why most of those um, alpha particles went right through it because there's a lot of space where there's really nothing. There's not a, there's a lot of nothing there. So given this incredibly dense, positively charged um, center called the nucleus, which is incredibly small in comparison to the whole size of the atom. And so you have the electrons whizzing around and the size of one atom is around 10 to the minus 10 meters, approximately. I mean, they're all, they're all slightly different sizes. So this would, our nucleus has protons and neutrons on the inside with positive charge and neutral charge. And you can see that is like 10,000 times smaller than the electrons, than, than, than the whole atom. So there's a huge difference in, in, in size. So the masses, pro, now this is what we call, we sort of talked about this a little bit before, atomic mass units. They had to give these uh, masses something. They can't just call them you know, they can't just refer to them as, you know, however, 10 to the minus, you know, 31 kilograms. That just, that'll take forever to say and write down. So they'll just say it's like one atomic mass unit. And a neutron, you can see, is slightly bigger, interestingly, by about the size of, of an electron. So that's why the two of them, a proton plus an electron, gives you a, a neutron, okay? So we've, done, we've gone over this a little bit, just, just to give a, give a quick review. When we're talking about a single specific atom, this, this atomic symbol, the number, and the mass basically gives you all the information you need about the number of protons, the number of neutrons, and the number of electrons. So the, the number on the, on the bottom left tells you what element it is, because that's the number of protons. And we know that the number of protons determines what element it is. You change the number of protons in the nucleus, that's a different element. You change the number of electrons, you just change the charge of it. It's the same element with a different charge. But you change the number of protons, it's no longer that particular element. So up here, A is the mass number, protons plus neutrons. Since basically all of the mass of, of the atom is in the middle, the electrons are so small, they basically don't uh, make up much mass at all. You don't even need to take them in, into consideration, really. Um, so that gives you the mass of the atom. And then if we have a charge, we put it over here. So we put like plus or minus or whatever the charge is. And so each one of these, remember, is a specific isotope. And we talked about isotopes also. Isotope refers to a particular atom. Not all the atoms, but just one in, in, in particular. Yeah. So carbon-12, if it's neutral, and here there's no charge, so it must be neutral, it's going to have six protons and six neutrons in the middle. That gives us our 12. And we're going to know how many electrons there are because it has to equal the number of protons to balance the charge. So just by giving this information, we automatically know about all the subatomic particles. Protons, neutrons, electrons. We know all the numbers. So 
neutral atoms. If you say the word atom, that means neutral. Um, because if it's not neutral, it's an ion. It's no longer, we don't call it an atom anymore. We call it an ion. So a neutral atom has to have a balanced charge. Same number of positives, same number of negatives. So just like I said, the atomic number also equals the number of, of electrons in an atom. Now in an ion, different. But in an atom, that's also the number of, of, of electrons. So we've done the mass number. Now ions, we sort of talked about them. We got eight. Whenever there's motorcycles going down the street, the dogs just lose their crap. Eight. So now remember, I'm going to keep making this point. Um, you only acquire charge in an ion by either gaining electrons or losing electrons. That's the only thing that, that changes the charge. So metals generally will give electrons away. And we'll learn why that is when we get to looking at the, at the periodic table and how it's, how it's laid out. Only by losing electrons. Nonmetals become negative ions by gaining electrons. And that's the only way you can change your status from uh, an element to an ion only by the, by the electrons. And now that we know how the atom is, is, is put together, that makes sense um, because since the electrons are far away, in some instances, far away from, from the nucleus, it's easy to lose or gain those. Whereas um, trying to mess with the, with, with the nucleus is much, much, much harder. And remember, whenever we mess with the nucleus, that is no longer a chemical reaction, that is a nuclear reaction. That is something entirely different. So let's just go through some of the chemical uh, symbols really quickly. You're probably familiar um, with most of them. Some of them are weird, right? Like we, we look at things like uh, potassium is K. A. What? And uh, sodium is Na. And gold is, is Au. And mercury is Hg. And lead is Pb. Like, whoop. where do all these letters come from? Well, most of them, most of the really, really old ones are derived from Latin and Greek uh, because they, hell, they discovered them first. And whoever discovers them first gets to name them. And so uh, one of my favorites is, is, is PB for lead. You, anyone know what the PB stands for? Everyone's typing away and looking it up. Hmm. PB is Latin. Anyone know what it what it stands for? Plumbum. Plumbum. Yeah, don't you love that? Plumbum. Plumbus or plumbum. Now, why it's called that is because um, and this is a really bad idea. It was used for plumbing. And so that this, the term plumber uh, comes from, comes from uh, Latin. And because plumbing was made out of lead, now we know that that's a really bad idea because you don't want lead in your drinking water. The people in Flint, Michigan will attest to that. Um, but the reason why lead was used for plumbing is that it's soft. It's a soft metal and it's really easy to fix. So you didn't need to weld it or, or, or anything like that because they didn't really know how to weld back then, all you would need is just like a, a, a thin sheet of, of, of lead and you'd hammer it on and fixed. And so it was used for plumbing. Little did they this know that they, were, that they were poisoning uh, themselves uh, with lead just... ions. Oh, plumbing just means uh, uh, pipes that bring water into your house <laughs> and takes oh. water away. So bad. yeah, bad idea to make it out of lead, but it was easy to use and actually for years and years and years, I mean, still and think in some really old houses still may have lead pipes in them. Um, they've been most, you can't do that anymore, obviously. They've been replaced with um, copper, um, but in like really old houses, like more than 150 years old, you will find uh, lead pipes still there because they'd been used for like thousands and thousands of years. 
So the symbol, what does the symbol mean? This is again, um, uh, mercury was, has, has been really, is a really old uh, material that people have been known about for a really long time because it has this fascinating property that it's a metal, but it's liquid. Um, so people have like, been studying mercury for a long time. Mercury, again, an element that's really, really toxic and that you probably shouldn't, shouldn't be playing with. But now the symbol represents mercury. Doesn't matter how much, one atom, 10 atoms, 50 pounds. It just refers to the atom. The thermometer, uh, the thermometer uses mercury, right? It used to be. Old thermometers, old thermometers that have that um, um, have the shiny material in it are are mercury. They don't really make those anymore. Um, all the thermometers it, you see now have a red in, material in them. It, it is still used in China. Yeah, yeah, it's not a great idea. Uh, what's what's used now is like this sort of this red dyed liquid, and it's basically um, ethanol. And so mercury was used for a long time because it expands and contracts at a very predictable rate with, with, um, with the temperature. And so, yeah, perfect. You know, it expands. You have these really, 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 really thin um, uh, tubes for the mercury to go in. But then it's much easier to make these things out of, well, um, uh, ethanol will expand and contract as well and so you just dye it red so you can see it easier and that's that's so we call those safety uh, thermometers yeah uh, mercury hasn't been used in thermometers here for a really long time so um, many people uh, in china has uh, sulfur uh, and in their home in, in just in case the the thermometer breaks yep yeah because then because then yeah you you what you don't want um, is, is the mercury vapor. And so if you throw sulfur on it, it immediately converts it to, to an ion, and then you can sweep it up and, and, and dispose of it. Mm -hmm. So you could hear, you can see that a lot of these names come from Latin roots. Like, and all of these uh, materials are basically materials that people have been using for thousands of years, like copper and gold and silver and sodium and tin, iron, lead. These are all things that have been known for like a really, really long time. And people have known about the chemistry of them for a really, really long time. And so um, they gave them the names and they stuck. So there was no, since potassium had been known as callium for like thousands of years, when it was time to give it the chemical symbol, um, we just used K because that's 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 what has been called for a really really long time. Does potassium uh, do something with potato? I don't know. I think it, it, the potassium comes from potash. Potash. It's a ore that contains um, uh, potassium. I think that's where the that's where the uh, name comes from. But you know. Again, I don't know everything about all of this stuff, but yeah, I think that's where it comes from. If I had to, if I had to guess. Yeah, I th think it does. Mm, yeah. So, just a little more to go, and then we'll uh, let let you go for the for for the morning. So, protons, neutrons, both weigh around one mass unit or one gram per per mole. Electron is thousands of times less. So the atomic mass is about equal to, to um, its mass number. We know that it's a little bit more, but it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty close. So most elements, though, aren't a single type of atom. Very, very few. Almost every um, element has isotopes. And so if you look at the periodic table, and you give it a, and it's given a, a, a mass, you get a mass number and you get basically the average mass. So it's written on the bottom. So what you would see is something like, you know, copper or copper, um, carbon, and then at the bottom, like, you know, 12.011 AMU. 
And so this is the average of all the isotopes of carbon. And so from that, you can tell that the vast majority of carbon has a mass of 12, and some must be a little bit more, 13. And we know carbon-14 is around because carbon-14 is, is radioactive. And so we can, huh. we can, we can detect carbon-14. But so the noble gas also has, have isotopes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And so the periodic table gives you the weighted average mass. So what a weighted average mass is, it is, is and we sort of did this in our recitation uh, last time, it gives you the abundance, like how abundant is it, times its mass. So, so we work it out like this. So we know that they're called isotopes, um, and the atomic number of those isotopes goes up at the top left that tells us how many protons, how many neutrons. Now the number is going to be strictly based on the number of neutrons because 24 magnesium, 25 magnesium, 26 magnesium all have the same number of protons. If they didn't, it wouldn't be magnesium. So we know that there's a difference of one neutron from 24 to 25 and then another neutron from 25 to 26. So it's only the neutrons that are different. So remember, this is how we do our mass number and atomic number and where we put our charge. Hydrogen has three um, isotopes. It's the simplest element, and yet it still has three different isotopes. So the vast majority of it is what we call protium because yeah. it is a single proton. That's why we call it protium. And you can see that it's almost 100% of, of, of hydrogen. You're probably familiar with deuterium. Anyone, what, what do we use deuterium for? What's deuterium make that we know about? Where would you find deuterium? Is it the sun or the water? It's found, well, everything's found in the sun up to iron. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's, yeah, water. What kind of water? Specific kind. Uh, we call it something specific. It's, water. it's not light water. It's heavy, heavy water. water. Heavy water. Yeah, so heavy <laughs> water is made of deuterium. And deuterium is also uh, given its own chemical symbol, D. So we call heavy water D2O, and it's used in it's used in a lot of of of, of um, uh, used in a lot of biology reactions, actually, uh, and study biochemistry study and, and biology study. If you want to see, like, basic uh, for one thing, if um, something is available to water. If you're looking at a particular protein or molecule or something, and, and if you want to know whether it's accessible to water, you put it in deuterium, you put it in heavy water, and you see if those atoms that are on the inside of that protein or whatever you're studying turn from hydrogen being attached to them to deuterium being attached to them. And if they switch rapidly, you know that it's accessible to water. And so basically we can see what's, what um, atoms are on the inside of a protein and what atoms are on the, um, on, on the outside. The other thing it's used for is in nuclear reactors because it absorbs um, neutrons. And so we know with a, with a nuclear reaction, neutrons are being given off. And when neutrons are given off, they hit another atom and split it and they cause a chain reaction. So you want to contain, you, want, you don't want that chain reaction to go you know, super, super fast that would be a, a nuclear explosion and we don't want that. So a lot of reactors have heavy water in them to slow the um, movement uh, of neutrons and absorb some of them so you, so you can control the reaction. And then the last one you may have also heard of called tritium, that has two neutrons and one proton. And you can still buy watches that have tritium tubes in them. Um, the tubes, are coated with, with a fluorescent um, or phosphorescent fluorescent uh, paint. 
and the tritium on the inside makes them glow. And so they glow in the dark all the time, unlike a lot of watches which you have to expose to, to, to um, light and then they'll stay glowing for a little while. Watches uh, with tritium tri tubes tri will glow for like 20 years. Tritium is the, the material to make a hydrogen bomb, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's radioactive. It's the, yeah, it's, it's, um, deuterium isn't radioactive, tritium is. So you can also, we also use that in, in certain biological experiments. Um, if we want to follow, uh, for instance, if we, if we want to follow where the hydrogen goes in, in, in a reaction, like in digestion or something, um, you just give a, um, a compound that's labeled with a radioactive hydrogen and then just trace where the, where the radioactivity goes. So the, the, those experiments were, were done a long time ago and are still done in order to, to follow uh, paths, um, reaction paths. So I think I'm gonna end there. Any questions before we, like this afternoon, uh, my group is gonna be working on recitation number three. So hopefully you'll be able, um, that is available on Canvas, I made it available yesterday. So you should like download that and have a look at it before, um, before the recitation section uh, this afternoon. Any other, any questions? <laughs> Everyone's either asleep or they know this stuff already, man. Like why you, we know this. Nope. Okay. I thought I heard a little voice in there. Nothing. Okay. All right. Uh, so my group, I will see you uh, nope. this, af this afternoon. Oh, Thank check, you, check the chat. Yes. Are you heading is, out? Is okay. there a lab assignment this week? Excuse me? Uh, is there a lab assignment this week? Yes. We, uh, lab number yeah, you want to write up lab number two and, and what we did lab, yeah, we did lab number two this week, the paper chromatography that is due on uh, Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. The, um, the labs are always due, the reports are always due a week after um, we do them together. Okay. Thank you, professor. Yeah, no problem. Is there anything else there? All right, I'll see you this afternoon. And for everybody else, uh, have fun with uh, AJ um, this afternoon. And I'll talk to you. Have a great weekend if I, if, if I don't see you before then. Stay well. <laughs>